So maybe to start out, David, for my audience, let's give a little background on how this ballot initiative evolved and how it came to be. I assume part of this had to do with the Red for Ed movement, which was so powerful in your state and other states in which we covered on this podcast. Yes, it, the Prop 208 was really four, four or more years in the making. Um, Arizona, no state in the country had cut more from its public education funding than Arizona during the Great Recession. And so we were feeling the ramifications of that in the form of one of the worst teacher shortage crisis and some of the largest class sizes. And so 2018 was our the Red for Ed movement where we had one of the largest teacher walkouts. We had 75,000 teachers marching on our state capitol. And so we brought a similar ballot initiative in 2018 that ended up getting removed by the, our state Supreme Court. And our coalition decided you know, we weren't gonna give up because we recognized we still had a funding crisis and we still recognized that we had a, a good policy that voters supported because we had done lots of polling to show that voters would support this. And so mm. uh, we said we would be back in 2020 if they didn't fix the funding crisis in our schools. And so we were back and we were able to get it over the finish line. So a couple of details there, something you mentioned, why did the state Supreme Court remove it from the ballot? What was the reasoning? Was it some technical thing that was wrong with it? It was a technicality that, uh -huh. the, and we had also, you know, that was our opposition was using that tactic of, of using a, a very stacked state Supreme Court to try and get it removed. Um, and, and so we took that uh, and learned from it and restructured the proposal to make sure that it was, would withstand any sort of legal challenges this time. And, and, uh, and so that was really instrumental in getting it passed this year. And the second thing you mentioned about teacher salaries and, and generally funding, you, you had a terrific report out in September 2020, and I urge my audience to go to the Arizona Center for Economic Progress website and read this report because it really gives the background to this. And I, I, I want to just highlight a couple of things that you pointed out that the per pupil instruction spending in 2018 was 13% lower than it was in 2009. And just a little bit below that, you then talk about teacher salaries, which again, we covered here on this podcast uh, back, uh, back in April of 2018. Teacher salaries in Arizona are also not faring well when compared to teachers nationwide. In 2000, te Arizona's teachers earn 19% less than the national average. And no surprise, you then have a teacher shortage in Arizona because people don't want to try to earn a living on such meager wages where I remember when I was covering the Red for Ed movement in Arizona and other states, there were teachers, and I want to emphasize this, there were teachers who had to go to food banks in order to make it to the end of the month to make sure their families had food in the United States of America. Right, right. Yeah. And it's still, you know, you hear stories of teachers having to work two or three jobs. You know, they're, they're working as servers in restaurants on the night in the evenings and the weekends in order to, to, to make ends meet. And, uh, and, and it's, it's only made our teacher shortage crisis worse. The, and then you combine the COVID pandemic. Um, we had uh, more than 1700 classrooms this year without a, a qualified certified teacher. And so this was so critical for our schools to get them the resources they need and, and to really address the, the funding crisis that we have in our schools in Arizona. So let's talk specifically, what does the proposition do now? It uh, establishes a three and a half percent income tax surcharge on um, taxpayers who earn above $500,000 a year if they are married couples or above $250,000 a year if you're a single filer. And so it establishes that surcharge only on the taxable income above those amounts. So anything that they earn below those amounts are taxed just as it is currently, but anything they above earn above that uh, has this three and a half percent surcharge on their on their taxable income. It basically taxes the top one percent of the wealthiest Arizonans. Mm -hmm. And in your computations that you've done at the center, and I assume along with the teachers union and other advocates, is that going to be enough to make up that gap that we just discussed in terms of basically dealing with uh, class size, teacher salaries? I noted that the money is going to be used, at least I'm quoting here from a, 
newspaper article to increase the salaries of teachers, nurses, counselors, classroom aides, and bus drivers. Right. Yes. Um, so we had a our Arizona Department of Revenue did a revenue estimate of this proposal, and their estimate um, for us that they did says that it'll raise about nine hundred and forty million dollars a year in new revenue. And so that that will be the, the single largest new investment in our public schools in more than 20 years. And so wow. it really is going to be transformational. It'll it'll address our, our teacher shortage crisis and uh, it'll 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 um, definitely be a big boost for our schools. Now, what's amazing to me when it comes to teachers and you can find this in many states, you have lots of say, anti-tax people, conservatives, even some people in companies who are against any kind of tax increases in general, but even to help education. And what is stunning to me, and I know you addressed this in your report, they don't look at the big picture, which is if you don't have teachers who are paid well, who are there to instruct the generation of the future, that ends up putting aside the moral argument here, that ends up hurting the economy and the productivity because Obviously, companies need, you know, future workers who are going to have skills and it's all connected if you don't pay folks enough to then have kids be able to get the kinds of education they need, then yeah. you're going to hurt the economy eventually, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And that was that was probably the most uh, perplexing and disappointing thing is to see that our opposition, who spent more than $20 million in trying to defeat us, where many, many of the, you know, the big business groups in Arizona, the Arizona Chamber of Commerce, the Phoenix Chamber of Commerce. And yet, you know, if you have listened to our CEOs over the last few years when they've been asked and when they've done surveys, they have said, like, what's one of the biggest obstacles to growing our economy in Arizona? And they've consistently said over the years, it's the lack of funding for our public education system. And yet, you know, when we had a proposal on, they were the, the biggest opponents and they did everything they could to try and defeat this, mainly because there was the CEOs who are in that top 1% who, who didn't want to see their own taxes increased. Um, but, but yes, you're exactly right. If you talk to most economists, they'll say one of the most smartest investment states can make to improve their economy, to grow their workforce, is to invest in their public education system. So we've been saying all along, this is going to be good for our economy. This is good for our workforce. And, and so I think our business leaders are going to start to see that now, but you know, they don't like the fact that you know, the CEOs are going to have to pay more, a little bit more in taxes. As my father used to said, say my heart bleeds for them, you know, or some people say, let me take out the smallest violin uh, to uh, accompany their tears. By the way, let's make the broader point. Those kinds of investments beyond education, I know you've done a lot of work on this too, infrastructure, all those kinds of things that make an economy vibrant, uh, paid sick leave, for example, all the things that kind of construct a social network, those are important too for a healthy economy. And those are things that have been opposed by those chamber of commerce mostly and businesses, not just in Arizona, but throughout the country. And you could argue that that kind of failed investment, the failure to invest in those things has really hobbled the nation's economy overall. Yes, for sure. And, and you know, Arizona has actually passed a number of progressive policies over the years at the ballot box, not through the legislature, but at the ballot box. And in 2016, we passed a, a minimum wage law that the same people who were opposing us in Prop 208 this year were the same ones who opposed the minimum wage. And it was funny that they used the exact same arguments that if we increase the minimum wage and it was gonna hurt business, it was gonna hurt our economy, businesses were gonna leave. And we've now had that minimum wage law in Arizona for three years and we've seen a lot of positive, none of the negative uh, claims that they made. And that's what we were saying in this campaign that you know, this is just all of these sort of sky is falling doomsday scenarios that our opposition put out there just aren't consistent with with what we know to be true is that when you invest in these things that that helps your economy it helps people move up the economic ladder so let's now talk a little bit about the bigger picture you and i talked a little bit offline about this element of what does this mean going forward and what are the lessons to learn one of the things that struck me throughout the election is how many progressive policies passed throughout the country despite what happened in individual races. So for example, in Florida, uh, 
which was heavily contested in the presidential race. And Donald Trump won that relatively comfortably. On the other hand, at the same time, 60% of people in Florida voted in favor of raising the minimum wage, the state minimum wage, to $15 an hour, which we would consider to be a progressive step. So in one sense, um, voters chose, you know, in the vernacular, a more conservative choice at the presidential level. But when you actually talked about pocketbook issues and things that mattered at the kitchen table, when it mattered to people thinking about what they would have to, uh, you know, look for in terms of their income and the ability to pay bills, a huge majority supported that in Florida. It's true here too in Arizona. Again, this may have changed, but the initiative, Prop 208, passed with a difference of about 116,000 votes. Now, it may be even bigger since the article because they've continued to count votes. The president, the presidential race was quite a bit more narrower. So the, the bottom line is, what did you take from that in terms of what you saw statewide and how you appeal to people going forward about these progressive kind of ideas? Yeah, it's really interesting. And, you know, we've done dozens and dozens of polls on this policy and this issue over the last four years. And it's been consistent that Arizonans recognize that we have an upside down tax code, that they recognize that the wealthy are getting the tax breaks. And so they've supported this policy. So it's interesting that statewide voters pass progressive policies in Arizona. But yet we were hoping that, you know, I think the Democrats were hoping that the chamber and the legislature were going to flip both in the House and the Senate, and they actually ended up just uh, staying basically the status quo. There's a Republicans will have a one seat advantage in both chambers. And, and when you look at it, I looked at the, the precinct by precinct map of our proposition yesterday. And it was really interesting that in the urban areas of Phoenix and Tucson, that's where a lot of the support came from Prop 208. But if you look in the rural areas, that's where most precincts um, voted against Proposition 208. And it's really interesting because when you talk about a tax on the wealthy, on the top 1%, very few of the people that are in that top 1% live in those rural areas. And also more money for education in many of the rural areas, the public schools tend to be some of the largest employers. So the rural area economies tend to gain from Prop 208 by the additional money that's gonna go into teacher salaries and creating jobs. So it's, it's really interesting that in the rural areas, they, they voted against their interests. I mean, they, they, they didn't stand to be harmed by any sort of tax increase and they really will get the benefits of the additional revenue. And I think that's where I see in Arizona in particular, but probably national, nationally too, is that we need to do a better job in those rural areas of, of just informing people about what these policies mean and how they impact their pocketbook. Um, because I think, that in, particularly in the urban areas, people get it, in, at least in Phoenix and in Tucson. Um, but in the rural areas of Arizona, um, even though Prop 208 would bring a lot of benefits and very little you know, uh, harm, they, they voted against it. And I would assume, at least this is true in some rural areas in other parts of the country, maybe not in Arizona, schools tend to be even more underfunded in rural areas as well because of the, the tax base is not as strong. Is that correct too in Arizona? For sure, yes. And, and you know, another aspect of Prop 208 is it will more than double state funding for vocational programs, which are, are huge for rural areas for their workforce development. And so, yeah, that, uh, that's probably, I think, one of the most perplexing things. But I think an area where we have a lot to learn from from this is that um, you know, why is it that people in rural areas uh, voted against this, but the you know, majority of people in the urban areas voted for it? Do you have an answer for that since you, since you raised the question? Or is it yeah. still perplexing? Other than it's oftentimes because at least progressive Democrats, however you want to frame it, don't know how to talk about taxes that well. And for years, for now going back decades, Republicans have dominated this uh, discussion in the language they use. And even people who are going to benefit from this, certainly people who are not going to be taxed, as you point out from Prop 208, it's only higher earners. But when people hear tax hikes, they automatically think they're coming after my pocketbook, no matter what you say. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And I think part of it is, 
organizations like mine, we have to do a better job of reaching out into the rural areas. You know, we have we've had a, you know, a lot more presence in urban areas in recent years. And you know, Arizona for years was a conservative state, but nationally people are putting money into organizations like mine to help kind of change that. And we're starting in the urban areas, but now we need to get more into the rural areas to you know, put some of our, you know, our materials and, and just talk to people in rural areas about, about policies and, and you know, what are the policies that will help them to move up the economic ladder. So I, I, I think we need to really be focusing more on those rural areas going forward. And that means, I assume, actually placing resources, boots on the ground, for lack of a better term, organizers who work in the communities on a regular basis. And also, it seems to me, this is, I'm going to speak now nationally. I don't know, again, the politics of Arizona that well in terms of the people who speak about this, but Democrats, people who have been speaking about taxes, they're afraid to talk about this. And it seems like too often they're mealy mouthed about it. And honestly, again, I don't know the context in Arizona, but part of the problem is the Democratic Party has repeatedly uh, been afraid to talk about higher taxes, partly because, let's face it, the party, many candidates are funded by wealthy people, have very strong ties to corporate interest. And so they don't want to talk about taxes because they're afraid that maybe the spigot might be turned off in terms of money coming to the party. I'm being very concrete about it. Right. No, I, I think you're right. And I, we do have to talk about it, talk about it though, because people, when you talk about it and you, you, you explain how these things work, people get it. I mean, that's, that's why this passed in Arizona is because we've spent a lot of time over the last few years, you know, educating Arizona voters that, of all the tax breaks that corporations and the wealthy have been getting and how we have one of the most regressive state tax codes. And, and we saw that people in Arizona, at least in the urban areas, got that. You know, they, they understood that, that, you know, that where the tax breaks have been going. But I don't think we've been doing enough of that. And maybe it is because we're afraid to talk about this in rural areas. But I think, you know, we have to start. We have to start having those discussions and those conversations um, more so in, in rural areas and say, and, and just show how some of these tax breaks and, and, and tax cuts over the years are not benefiting people in rural communities and how it's, it's hurting investments and how it's hurting their own opportunities to, to uh, have better, better lives. And so that's, that's where I think a lot of our work has to focus going forward is, is changing that dynamic. Mm -hmm. And last question I ask you, to, to what extent was there a racial component to this, meaning where you have in rural areas a less um, a community that has less people of color, where especially in urban areas, funding for schools, you know, let's face it, funding for schools for people of color in schools um, throughout the country is always disadvantaged compared to rural suburban areas. And I'm wondering whether there you saw a racial breakdown as well here. Yeah, I think so. I mean, obviously, a, a lot of the Arizona, the aspect that Arizona is turning blue, where we voted for President Biden and we have a second uh, Democratic U.S. senator, a lot of that's attributable to the organizing that's going on in communities of color, and that's where we've focused a lot of our efforts in, in really, you know, talking about how these disinvestments are hurting communities of color. And so, but I and we have to continue that. We have to continue to build upon that. But I think also now. We have to have those conversations in rural communities and say it's also impacting you that these disinvestments are are, are um, hurting your workforce. They're hurting your ability to to uh, create those economic opportunities as well. Because it's not just the schools that are in communities of color that are being disinvested. It's also in the rural areas that are being impacted as well. And so I think going forward, like I said, that's that's I think where we have to start to put more emphasis. Well, your work has been great. Um, we've talked before, and the fact that the Proposition 208 passed uh, was one of the bright lights in this election in terms of you know the political realities. So thanks very much for being on the show. We'll track this, and we'll have you back to kind of update us about how it's going. Sure. Thank you.